let us pray a loving and living god once again we come before your throne of grace seeking your guidance and your wisdom lord as we are here to meditate upon your holy word we pray that you enable us to understand your word and walk according to your will we seek the leading of your spirit our knowledge our talents are not enough to understand your word so we pray that let your holy spirit move within us in jesus name we pray amen once again i welcome you all in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ for this morning uh, devotion for this sermon i would like to focus on the gospel passage that has been read to us from saint luke chapter 8 verses 22 to 25 now these four verses teaches us a lot of things about faith because in the beginning of the verse itself in that passage jesus had asked a remarkable question where is your faith uh, to understand this question we need to understand the paradox that is there in this passage so what is that paradox or mystery that is there we see a different jesus here you know in this passage we see a jesus who was tired we see a jesus who fell asleep as he sailed on a boat and this is something a common experience that as human beings we all undergo you know whenever we travel you know in bus or travel or any other means of transportation sometimes we fell asleep right the other day i was traveling from the segmore station by a local train the moment the train started to leave you know the co passenger who sat next to me fell asleep so we have all this kind of experience while travel either we might fell we might have slept or the co passenger who sat next to us might have slept and jesus here showing a common human experience you know we don't see a mighty and great lord we just see a common man you know experience that he was tired and he fell asleep as he sailed on the boat and this shows that jesus is fully human the next thing that i would like to focus from here is that when jesus gets up you know he immediately rebukes the wind and the sea now the interesting part is the sea and the wind obeyed to him that's the interesting part and they become still so the disciples were surprised and they were asking you know who can this be the same event was recorded in matthew chapter 8 now there it was said what kind of man is this what kind of man is this in matthew chapter 8 verse 27 so while jesus had a body of flesh and blood like us at the same time he was also the lord of all creation that's why you know in uh, john chapter 1 verses 3 and 14 if we see it says all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made and in the next verse it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory so this is the mystery or this is the paradox that i was talking about in the beginning jesus was both god and man two natures in one person two natures unmixed yet together so we are not just looking at a good person or a human being rather we are coming face to face with the lord god himself who came down to earth in human form to dwell among his creation so i think with this understanding let us move forward with the question where is your faith now the moment you talk about faith some basic 
qualities of faith would pop up in our mind. You know, the first thing would be uh, faith never fears. When we look at a challenge, if we panicked, then our friend or somebody, you know, who would say, you don't you have faith? You know, why are you so fearful? So it always, you know, comes with the underline that if you have faith, you will not fear with life's problem. So faith never fears. But when we look at the event that was described in this gospel passage, we see the disciples of Jesus panicked. And that's why, you know, Jesus was asking, why are you so fearful? And in uh, Matthew chapter 8, it says, you little faith. You of little faith. So he was actually scolding them. He was actually, you know, rebuking them for being so fearful. And the reason was, Jesus himself was with him. Jesus himself was traveling with them, or sailing with them in the boat, and yet they panicked. Now, let's put ourselves in the place of disciples. You know, imagine if we were in that small boat and there comes a furious storm and the situation gets worse because Jesus was sleeping. You know, he doesn't care about it. You know? And I think most of us would have reacted in the same way as the disciples did. You know? And when we go to Jesus, you know, with our fear and with our own confusions and doubts, and Jesus rebukes us, saying, why are you so fearful? You know, if you are my followers, you are not supposed to be panicking by looking at all these things, how the situations may be. So when I meditated on this passage, I really wondered, you know, is it really possible for us not to panic? It's very easy to say. You know, it's very easy to give a sermon, it's very easy to speak and give a lecture, but when it really comes to us in our life, is it really possible for us not to panic? Or how can we not panic even in the midst of crisis? But as disciples of Christ, we are called to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, we expect great things from God. Right? We always expect great things from God. But we also need to remember, this passage reminds us, that God also expects a great faith from us. And this is possible only if we realize the fact, the presence of God is always with me. In other words, Jesus is in my boat. Jesus is in my home. Jesus is in my life. So when I have that kind of belief, that kind of experience or relation with my God and that is where we could able to you know, overcome this kind of panic when we met with life challenges. You know, let, uh, let me give a small example. Imagine a person who doesn't know to swim, you know, just fell on the sea or ocean. How he would react by looking at the large waves? You know, he would have screamed or you know, shouted for help, you know, help me and all. But imagine a person who is a fine swimmer. Do you think he would have screamed or shouted? No. The same large waves would come, but he would rather enjoy the waves. Right? The ocean is same, the waves are same, but one person was screaming and the other person was enjoying the waves. Now that's the difference, you know. All, we all of us have sickness. We all of us have to meet a sudden loss or trouble in our lives. But our perspective changes towards the challenges. Or the way we look at things immediately changes when we realize that God is always with me and everything is under his control. Now that is what, you know, this passage clearly tells us that we should never allow the situation to control us rather with faith in Jesus we should always believe that Jesus is controlled he is the in charge you know so nothing goes out of hand nothing goes in my life against God's will or plan or purpose so when I have that kind of faith in my life no matter what challenges I may face in my life you know it would be like uh, a swimmer 
who would enjoy the waves you know when i meet challenges i would say okay this journey is going to be an adventurous one let me wait and see how god is going to take me through you know that would be our attitude the apostle paul said you know in philippians chapter 4 verses 10 and in 13 I have learned in whatever state I am to be content I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is it possible for me not to panic when i met with challenges and crises i cannot do it but with Christ it is possible i as a human being i cannot do it my flesh is weak but with my faith in Christ who strengthens me i could able to do it now as christians we are never to be controlled by the situation rather we are to control the situation by faith that resides within us therefore faith never fears secondly when we talk about faith the other thing that comes is uh, faith never doubts you know that's why we call one of the disciples as uh, you know doubting thomas and my name is also thomas okay. so faith never doubts now when the disciples you know met with that kind of situation they panicked which really shows a lack of trust which really shows a lack of confidence in Jesus to see us through the storm now this is why Jesus you know uh, made a, a severe uh, a remark by saying that don't you trust me did i not say that we are going to be on the other side if you look at the beginning of this uh, you know passage jesus was saying uh, let us go to the other side you know? so that's the assurance that's the promise you know jesus the word gives a word you know that we will reach the other side so when i say we will reach the other side why don't you trust me why don't you trust on the promises that i give you why don't you trust on the assurance that i gave you Now in our life you know when we pray when we have our own personal relationship with our god our god gives us promises our god gives us assurance and it is us who needs to trust on those promises it is we who need to trust on those assurances now again the disciples were saying master master we are you know drowning we are perishing we are drowning so again it's uh, it's a lack of faith but when we meditate on this passage uh, looking at the whole thing uh, objectively in the disciples life uh, it's very easy sometimes but then when we are faced with such situations many times we might have also expressed such kind of doubts or lack of trust or confidence now how to overcome this or sometimes we wonder i am a faithful christian but when i met with some crisis why do i lack trust why do i doubt myself you know how to overcome this so these questions you know in our own personal life at some point of the time we might would have asked ourselves you know why lord you know why am i so weak in faith you know um, there was a man in a village who always liked to do some adventurous things okay so once he called all the villagers and he said i am going to try uh, a tight rope walking you know i wanted to walk on the rope uh, do you think can i do it then the whole villagers were so happy uh, because somebody is going to do something adventurous so the villagers were yes you know you can do it so or the villagers were you know clapping their hands encouraging him and he could able to successfully walk on the rope and reach the other side and then immediately he asked the villagers now do you think i can do this again by carrying a child on my shoulders uh, immediately the villagers were yes why not you can do this you know then he says okay and then send one of your child there was a pin drop silence you know nobody is willing to send their child so he looked at his 3 uh, year old daughter and immediately without any hesitation she climbs on his on her dad's shoulder and both of them cross and reach the other end now what's the difference between the villagers 
and his daughter. The villagers also believed, you know, you can do it, but I cannot risk my life with you. <laughs> so many times as Christians, our faith in the Lord is like that. You know, I believe in Jesus. I believe you can do healings. I believe you can forgive my sins. I believe uh, you can do wonders. But I cannot risk my life, you know, to do something depending on you or trusting you. But the three-year-old daughter, you know, without any hesitation, who climbs on her dad's shoulder, the faith that she had was, he is my father. You know, no matter what, he will never let me down. He will never ever let me down. Now that's the kind of faith we need to have as Christians with our Lord. Then only we could able to risk our lives. You know, imagine the missionaries in the 19th and 20th century. On what assurance they left their hometown and country and came to India and to other countries. You know, risking their life. They came out of their comfort zone because they trust in the Lord. That my God will never ever let me down. Now that's the kind of faith if we have, we can attempt great things and God will help us to achieve great things. Now that is what it comes when it talks about faith never doubts. And the third aspect of faith is faith expects trials. You know, when you talk about faith, you can't really are uh, in a holistic way of understanding faith without any trials. Or we can say trials are like a measuring rod to the kind of faith that we have. The kind of trials we overcome, it helps us to understand what kind of faith that I have in my Lord. So faith expects trials. Now in this passage, when you look at this passage, the first question that might come to our mind is that why did God allow this storm in the first place? Instead of rebuking it and stopping it immediately, Jesus could have done even before it, right? But then why did God allow this storm in the first place? It's clearly like testing the water, you know, testing his disciples. And trials are something that test our faith. Just like the fire refines the gold, our faiths get matured by trials. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, instead of becoming a swimmer who could enjoy the waves of the ocean, many a times we become a shallow uh, Christians. We want to swim in the shallow waters. And the interesting thing about shallow water is that it's not so deep and we can touch the ground with our feet anytime we want, you know. So, to swim in shallow waters, a shallow faith is enough. But to swim in deep waters, we need a deep faith. A faith that assures that God is in control of everything. And it is very interesting to note that trial is not something that has caused distress to these disciples. See, sometimes we wonder, the disciples panicked, the disciples uh, were afraid because of the storm. But I believe that more than the storm, what caused them that distress and that fear was that Jesus was not caring. You know, it looks like that. You know, that we are struggling. We are at the verge of death or drowning. But we see our master simply sleeping. You know. So Jesus doesn't care about my pain, about my struggle. And that thought made them more distress. And now let us take a moment and think ourselves. In our lives, was there any moment that we felt that God is not listening to my prayer? God doesn't care about my pain or my struggle that I am undergoing now. Or God doesn't care about my loneliness or what I am going through in my life. Have we ever come across that kind of situation? Because more than the challenges and problems that we face, it is this kind of thought that will cause more distress and it will make us to panic more. And it was here we need to understand 
the truth. The truth is Jesus knew that the storm was coming. And that's why he gave the assurance we will reach the other side. You know? So it is in those times we always need to look back to the promises. We always need to go back to the assurance which God gave to us. Because in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, it again gives us the assurance, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And therefore, when it comes to faith or when we face with trials, let us stop asking the question why and know that what we are facing now, that God knows about it, and he will always take us to a better future with hope. And if we are somehow tempted to think that God has abandoned us, we need to remember that Jesus is always in my boat. That Jesus is always with me in my life because he has promised that he will never leave nor forsake us. And he will accomplish his plan and purpose for our life. Now traditionally, uh, we would meditate on this passage in this way and we would compare the storm with the storms that we face in our life storms of fear storms of struggle storms of crisis and we would stop there but today as we observe environment sunday i take you to go for a, a bit further and to explore more in this passage you know when we look at god's creation when we look at this environment, what is our responsibility? You know, we all are God's creation, and what is our responsibility? Now, when we talk about storm and challenges in our life, I also need to put throw some questions. Are we the only one who experienced the storm? Are we the only ones who groan? Is human beings alone experience the storm, or along with us? other God's creation also experiences this kind of storm. And even further, we can ask a question, are we responsible to these storms in any way? Sometimes uh, we are responsible to some of the storms uh, that comes in our life. So in today's world, there are storms that shook our earth. We are troubled with the storms of climate change. We are troubled with the storms of uh, uh, global warming or water scarcity. Just a month ago, in the news you all might have seen, uh, in the city of Bangalore, there were quite a lot of you know, water scarcity and people started to migrate to nearby villages. In Tamil, there is a saying, Don't spend your money lavishly like water. It means water can be spent lavishly but not money all right but today we came to understand the fact that water is precious than money you know two or three decades ago if anyone would have told us you know from the future from 30 years from now you will see that if you waste clean drinking water you will be fined we would have really laughed at that person you know but today in delhi they made a rule that if anybody wasting clean drinking water, they will be fined up to 2,000 rupees minimum. You know? So that is how we are, you know, understanding the environmental crisis these days. So in such a context, as Christians, what is our responsibility? What is our role as a church? How do we respond to it? Now to understand towards our responsibility towards God's creation, first of all, we need to understand that uh, uh, spirituality has many dimensions. And one of the dimension is eco-spirituality. Now spirituality means the relation is I and my God. But in eco-spirituality, it helps us to understand that I relate with my God, not in a vacuum, but I relate with my God in and through God's creation. So eco-spirituality invites us to recognize the interconnectedness and interdependence with us and God's creation. And that reminds us about our responsibility to protect the nature. 
to protect the nature now sometimes we think god is our messiah but in eco spirituality it helps us to understand that god is not only a messiah for human beings but our god is also an eco messiah eco savior for example in isaiah chapter 43 verse 20 it says the wild animals will honor me the jackals and the ostriches for i give water in the desert and rivers in the wilderness it shows that our god as an eco messiah not only provides water to god's people in the wilderness but our god also provides water to the animals and birds in the desert and it really teaches us that we as christians we have a greater responsibility to liberate and heal the earth that has been damaged now after listening to all these you know eco spirituality eco messiah it's very good concept but how do i practice in my life you know concept wise is theory wise it's very nice but practically how as an individual how do i do it i can't leave all my work and become an activist now right so how do i do it one small step can bring big big difference one small step can bring big difference you know uh, recently you know i saw a, a video like this where a man goes to the you know roadside uh, vendor and inquires about the price of a tender coconut you know and then the vendor says you know 50 rupees now he wanted to bargain he wanted to reduce now he said no i can't afford if you want you take otherwise leave it now he gets offended and he goes to the next shop and buy a soft drink now this vendor you know ask him did you bargain there i was like no so he was saying you never bargained with a millionaire who owns the soft drink multinational company but you always want to bargain and reduce something with a poor roadside vendor you know uh, what kind of man you are imagine uh, can you remember the words that the disciples tell said about that uh, jesus what kind of man this be you know so what kind of man or woman i am with regard to the creation with regard to the people who actually protect the nature now responsibility and protecting towards nature not only concerns about the trees and waters and natural resources but also it deals with people who work with the nature people who protect the nature really so our responsibility or two aspects number one our responsibility to protect the nature and number two we need to really support and protect the people who work with the nature like farmers and others and that is how we can practice this eco spirituality and we can ourselves become eco messiahs following the footsteps of our lord and savior jesus christ so my dear brothers and sisters in christ when we find ourselves in the midst of trials and testing in our lives let us not panic rather let us trust in the lord and take refuge in our god because he will receive us he will bless us and he will bring deliverance to us and he will always calm the raging storm this shall be the nature of our faith may god bless these words let us look to god in prayer gracious and loving god we thank you for your word lord many a times in our lives we might have showed a poor faith in our life but you are always gracious and merciful towards us you always forgives us thank you for that compassion and the love that you are showing towards us and we pray that you strengthen our faith that we may not be feeble in our faith anymore but we will be strong in our faith that no matter what life may bring to us it should not disturb us because we should have a strong faith that you are with us your abiding presence is always with us we pray that you show your grace to each and every one of us to have such a great faith in jesus name we pray amen